Um, hello. Hi. Hi. I would like to welcome you all to our first YouTube live session uh, in charge of Ben Tissel and empowering Central American and Caribbean Basin Tissel affiliate. Um, on this occasion, we have Dr. Crystal Brody, who is in charge of a webinar entitled Teacher Digital Literacy, Improving Language Learning, Program Administration, and other professional activities by using free digital tools. Before we start this session, I would like to share with you some pieces of information. First of all, I would like to thank Crystal as our presenter today, and I would also like to thank the Central American and the Caribbean Basin TESOL affiliates, which you can see on your screens. We have Argentina, Belize, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba. We have Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and of course, Venezuela, who is the host of today's webinars. Um, at the same time, I would like to extend to you the invitation to the fourth annual convention and 14th biannual, biannual regional TESOL group of, the, of Central America and the Caribbean Basin, which is on July 13 and 14 on UNITEC Tegucigalpa. Um, at the same time, for those of you who are part of our Ben TESOL affiliate, previous to our national convention, we, can, we have the kickoff tour strengthening the ELT community and it's coming to a city near you. If, would like to know, if you would like to know when is going to be your hometown, please check our social media. And finally, we have Ben TESOL 36 national convention strengthening the ELT community, which is going to be on May 26th and 27th, 2018 at Hotel Esperia, Venezuela. If you want to follow us on our social media, here you have them on screen. It's ventisol.org for our webpage. And then we have Facebook as Ventisol, the main group, but we have a group for every single one of our states. And then we have at Ventisol for Twitter, Ventisol um, for Instagram, and Venezuela Tiso for YouTube. Okay, um, before we start, I'm going to give you some information about our presenter. It's Dr. Crystal Brody. She's a full professor of graduate education, the chair of graduate advanced programs, the director of the ESL teacher education at Georgetown College USA, and a specialist for call ELT. She is an internationally known keynote speaker and author of books, book chapters, articles, and many other publication types, as well as the manager of an international ELT professional learning community with members in 179 countries via social media on Facebook, blog, LinkedIn, and Twitter on call topics. She is a past president and current board member of the Kentucky TESOL, former chair of the TESOL EEIS and current call steering board member. A Cape and Cape program reviewer, she, is also, she also represented TESOL at Cape and on the national work group for the seal of bilinguality in K-12 USA schools. Currently, she is a new board member of the TESOL International uh, Organization. Without further uh, Things to do. I'm going to give the word to Crystal. Uh, to Crystal. Crystal, floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, I'm um, very much sorry about the uh, time mix up. Uh, we in America have this crazy spring forward thing that nobody likes, but it really messes up time um, management with international partners. 
So we're going to talk about um, infusing technology in, in your teaching more, and not just in your teaching, but in all of your aspects of your work. And um, to that end, I'm trying to fast forward my slide. I have a QR code here. And who can read this little writing on the top left side? Just post it in your, in your uh, um, chat space. I'm going to go on and I'm going to re uh, repeat the QR code at the very end again if you didn't catch it now, so you have access to the presentation on your own device. Um, I want to start out by talking about using standards. So a lot of us are using technology here and there and sometimes here, but we're really not very purposeful in doing that in a more framework kind of way. So I want to just offer one of my countrymen's quotes, one never goes as so far as when one doesn't know where one is going. And this is by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of my fellow countrymen. And we Germans like, you know, planning, as you know. So um, why am I bringing this up? Because um, we should, when we use technology, we should have like a bigger picture in mind while we're using it, um, to what purpose. Um, so we can also work, uh, all of us, towards the same end result, um, basing it on the same framework, and we can compare our work and results across programs and students, like was in the Caribbean um, countries, and teachers in many different scenarios can work in unison and compare their work better. And professionalizing the profession is a really big deal because a lot of us reinvent the wheel over and over, and that's really a waste of time. So uh, where do you start with standards? So when you look at the TESOL page, you find lots of different standards for short-term programs, for teacher education programs, for English language proficiency standards. And I all encourage you to look at the various standards and, and kind of see where they can fit with your organization um, and um, you know how to use them. But we also have the TESOL technology standards, only they're quite a few years old, and technology has um, really taken a lot of advances since. And so instead of using them, I'm using the ISTE, International um, um, Society of Teacher Education, of Technology Education Around the World um, Standards. And they have a wonderful mm -hmm. website, and I hope I implore you to check it out. Um, they are specifically um, talking about teacher standards for educators. They also have teacher standards for students, teaching standards for students, but we're going to focus on the ones for the teacher today here. The teacher as learner, the teacher as leader, the teacher as a citizen, the teacher as a collaborator, the teacher as a designer, the teacher as a facilitator, the teacher as an analyst. So we're going to kind of look at those different um, standards. And as you look at them, you already see it's not about using PowerPoint in your class or um, any assessment tools. It's really looking at technology as a more from a much wider lens, you know. And we're going to kind of look at them in more detail. We're going to unpack them now and look at what they mean and what standards, um, what technology we can use with each standard. So let's look first as teacher as le learners. Like, the fact that you're here today already shows that you're meeting this standard for sure. You're looking into professional development and look at yourself as a learner. And specifically, um, the standards applying to this are set professional learning goals, um, explore and apply pedagogical approaches made possible by technology, and reflect on the effectiveness. And I, I pulled out three different standards here. And let me just say that the um, presentation is really, really packed with resources. So I'm not going to go over everything I'm going to give you here. But you can make use of all the resources later and um, look at um, what, what of those you are um, going to use in your context. There are more um, standards here, teacher as leader. And I pulled out those ones that I'm going to address today the teacher modeling digital citizenship. So this is a kind of a new one that in many models and many teacher um, education standards is not included in the past ones. The teacher as collaborator. And again, all of you are here and working together, and that's um, definitely met also. Teacher as designer. The teacher as facilitator. The teacher as an analyst. 
and making use of data mainly. And here is resources for digital literacy that you guys can use later and more for professional development with videos and um, resources for you. So let's look at what we can do with the state teacher standards in our language programs and classrooms using technology. And here you see like a little wordle about all the stuff that you need to think about. So why do we use technology in our ELT context? We, among other things, this is not an exhaustive list, we plan lessons, we create forms, do documents, we store data, we read with our students and ourselves, we do academic writing, we try to enhance uh, meaning and comprehension with technology, we drill, we do listening activities, we apply concepts, we teach culture, we collaborate, and these are only some contexts. So how do we all connect the dots of the standards, indicators, and tools? So one of the things we can use is specifically for um, standard 6B, manage the use of technology and student learn learning strategies and digital platforms. So many of us try to do that. We use different platforms and of course, one of them that's free and it has incredible potential is Google Classroom. It can extend your classroom in the cloud, and um, it's also available in 40 languages, if you can imagine that. So if you have students in your classes that are not Spanish speakers, you can also help them uh, in their own heritage languages. Um, you, um, you can use it in, in tons of different ways. You can have entire instructional programs housed there. You can have individual classes. Or you can just um, outsource some activities, um, like front load activities and teaching, and uh, give your students access in one place that's safe and is protected of in privacy. I give you resources here on how to use it. So then the other thing that you can do is using Google Forms. And we all do a lot of that for lesson planning, lessons, actually delivering lessons and lesson activities. And we also can use it for assessment. So um, as far as the ISTE standards are concerned, uh, Google Forms are great to address um, alternative ways for students to demonstrate competency and reflect on their learning using technology. If you see like the new standards all talk about reflection a lot and thinking about your learning and metacognitive strategies. Use technology to design and implement a variety of formative and summative assessments. And again, to accommodate learner needs. And this is to um, address all learners, not just the middle of the pack. Using assessment data to guide process and communicate with students and teachers and also guide self-direction in students. So when you give them forms where they can assess their own work and get feedback right away on the cloud, and you can apply instructional design principles, of course. So um, creating forms is super, super easy. There are a lot of different templates here that you can use in your teaching from um, historical Facebook, charts and spreadsheets, lesson planner, project tr trackers, class notes, essay, essay grading rubrics. And I give them all of you here so you can later on see which ones you want to use. Um, you can print Google Forms. And how to do that is outlined here. Um, you can also add pictures to it, your own pictures, and customize the background of a form and make it your own one because um, not all forms are applicable to each context. So you can bring um, your um, learning topic of your unit into the game much easier or have your students create them. How to do that is here on the link. Um, you can have automatic lesson planners with Google Forms, which is really cool because um, then you keep them and you can mo slightly modify them in the future according to how well they worked. And then also you can use all these different Google tools here um, to um, change your lessons and make them better. And there's a resource for you here. So, um, and like I said before, make the Google form looking right for your purpose. You know, don't just be happy with the ones provided because they get really boring and, and learners like to be surprised. It takes literally just a minute to change your forms and just make them good. 
you can also create PDFs in Google Forms. Why is this good? Because um, if you um, create documents for your students, you don't want them to be able to modify them and change them into something else. So, um, you know, make sure you have a little safety device here so your students cannot monkey around with them. Um, you can also use them to automatically grade, grade quizzes and exams with them. So I give you a resource for that. And there's another tutorial for you, just in case if you are a more of a beginner person. So, okay, so now we're going to go to um, another standard three, protecting your data. And this is really important today, where on the internet, where everybody can share everything with everybody. We want to also protect your own intellectual property, the privacy of your students, the data that you collect, and student progress. Um, and the um, standards are pulled out for that is to mentor students in safe, legal, and ethical practices. So it is also your job as a teacher using technology to model responsible behaviors and um, to model to them how to protect intellectual rights and property, not for your own purpose of protecting yourself, but also to model it to your learners. Also, it's really important more than any time in the past to model the management of personal data and digital identity. And this is so important because students put virtually anything online. They put pictures there with, um, in situations where they really don't want to be photographed. And uh, they may destroy the entire future when somebody gets a hold of those um, photos for college admission or workplaces. and. Uh, modeling the behavior to your students is really important. So um, one thing is you can teach your students and use yourself a password to protect your documents uh, in Google. So here's a source for you how to do that. Um, back up to your data. Uh, students are notorious in losing data. So you can also back up your, your Google Drive data itself. So just because it's on Google Drive doesn't make it safe. So here are some tips on how to save and back up your data on Google Drive. Um, and backing up your entire Google Drive content. Don't want to ever take a chance of losing all your work that you backed up on the cloud. So, um, you know, data storage, of course, you need to teach your students um, be responsible with that. Um, forget about the old flash drives or eternal hard drives and um, learn about how to be more effective with backing up data. Um, also, teach your students on how to use Google when there's internet outage. So, um, help them to use Google Drive offline and access these guides here. This is particularly something that comes to my mind with my friends in Venezuela who have perpetual problems, which I experienced myself in uh, electricity and access to the internet. So this is a good tool for people like them. Okay, let's go back to um, Google Docs again, um, creation, collaboration, publishing, and so much more. So um, for standard four, six, and seven, addressing Google Docs, collaborate and co-learn with students to discover and use new digital resources and diagnose and troubleshoot technical issues. So you need to teach your students what they need to do when something doesn't work. It's not a, only about your own management of problems, but also teaching your students what they need to do when something happens. So this is one of the standards that teachers should meet. You also need to model and nurture creativity and creative expressions. So this is where Google Docs and Google Forms are great because you can personalize them in any way, different form to uh, make them an expression of creativity. Create learning opportunities that challenge students to use a design process on computational thinking. Computational thinking, by the way, today is the number one job skill. It is not enough anymore to be creative because today um, um, the big companies are all using for computational approaches to each discipline. So teach your students to think computational and model it to them in your classes, in your English classes. Particularly those of you who do English for special purposes definitely make inclusion of computational processes in your class and provide alternative um, ways to your students to, um, one second, I'm always getting this bar here, I need to put that away, um, one second. 
oopsie daisy provide alternative ways for your students to demonstrate competency so um don't don't just seek one way of showing um competency in an area provide different ways that students can send you um, products so they can show you how they did it in their own way so how to share documents with students some teachers still struggle with that um, i give you here a link that you can um, use to do that uh, don't be afraid that when somebody can access one document that they can access all of your documents that's not the case and learn you how to do it um, add your images to uh, with captions in Google Docs. This is really cool for language classes. So you can um, do um, vocabulary sheets with pictures, and um, this is the way to do it here. Click the link and learn how to do it. So now we come to the area of academic writing and research. Wow. This is one of the very, very difficult areas for English learners. Um, the standards applicable here are standard 3B, 3C, and 7A. Establish a learning culture that promotes curiosity and critical examination of online resources and foster digital literacy and media fluency. So this is so important that um, we need to teach our students how to critically examine online resources. You cannot write a paper and use Wikipedia references. Um, digital literacy is so important with all the fake news that are out there today um, and deliberately fake news. So we need to really teach our students how to be critical users of data and information online and uh, become media fluent. Um, many of us teachers and many adults fall for this. You know, many people put, put things on Facebook. They're completely untrue and, um, you know, make no sense. Um, and then somebody else writes to them and says, you know, be careful because this is fake news, um, check it out. And so we need to teach our students how to be better users of online information. You also need to mentor students in safe legal and ethical practices, um, particularly in regards to intellectual rights and properties. Many students think it's super easy to cut and paste somebody else's um, sections of papers and import them in their own papers and they don't think of it as intellectual property or stealing but they actually do and so teach them in your classes that this is not acceptable and how to um, monitor this better um, also provide alternative ways to students to demonstrate their competency and reflect on their learning with using technology but i think for me the digital literacy and information literacy is really the most important so um one of the issues for it, particularly for, for readers of other home languages, is um, doing really good Google searches. So here's a handy sheet of um, how to use search modifiers on how to do this. And I remember when I started doing searches my first years of living in America, it was such a difficult thing because you go and translate something in the dictionary and it's not the right word that you're looking for. Teach your kids how to do good searches in English please do and let them um, try it out. Um, the search terms are very difficult to find. So here's some more resources for you, how to find better search terms and um, how to conduct good research using Google Scholar. Scholar. So um, use this resource if you want to learn a little bit more about that, if you have advanced students, but it's never too early to start doing this. this. Then for those people who write academic papers, um, of course, you have style formatting like APA, MLA. Everybody in the behavioral science should always use APA. MLA is for literature people. And I cannot tell you how important it is for people come to America or to English speaking countries to be able to use the correct formatting. And here are resources for you um, how to use those in Google Docs. They have a new tool now. Uh, an add-on that you can use that formats things and make sure that everything is done right. Um, some other thing is Google um, Docs can also create columns. You know, if you want to do something that's more um, like a newspaper or newsletter or any other purpose, you can make columns. And how to convert an image of text into an editable Google Doc. This is great for English classes. You know, we love using images and videos. So um, here's a little um, link on how, how to do that. Um, voice typing, oh my gosh, the possibilities. 
Um, when people learn English, using Google Docs with voice typing really shows them when their pronunciation is not correct. Because when they uh, pronounce something wrong, it will type it wrong. So this is a great check of their pronun pronunciation abilities. And then tell them to listen to a word in Google, let Google speak it out for them and try to listen to it. For unfortunately, we non-native speakers, we cannot hear our own accent. And uh, it's a really good eye opener for them to use Google voice typing. Um, you can also use um, Google Docs for bilingual student writers. Um, there's like text mentors um, that you can use. And, and, and here's a wonderful um, way of using this um, in seven ways. Um, I hope that you have time to look over this. How to share Google Docs with others amongst the students. Again, share this with them so they can collaborate with one another. And uh, here are seven add-ons that will make it really easy for you to, um, to use Google um, more effectively. One of my favorite is read and write. Um, Grammarly, I, I would use, I make every student use Grammarly, which within the text and even in emails um, corrects their writing. I mean, I, I would not have a student write without using Grammarly and make them uh, download this extension into theirs. Um, read and write is great because you can use voice animation with it and try out all the be best um, add-ons listed here. One of the fun things you can do um, in, in your Google Docs and Google Slides is a video mashup. That's an activity where you mash up videos and um, you know let students recreate them. Check it out here you can actually make kids do animations in Google. So this is so much fun and um, the especially beginning learners are doing a great job when their writing skills are limited and they use pictures instead of um, writing actually. And there's this new animation tool which is really awesome. You know, they can create stories and animate them. It's like a different way of digital storytelling, much more suited for younger learners. You can do audio recordings in Google Slides. Um, I use Google uh, audio recordings for my research students when they um, create their final research poster for their capstone. And I let, let them narrate it to explain what they did. And it's like a real presentation, but asynchronously. So this is a great tool for language uh, classes. Um, Voice Notes has some um, important updates and they are posted here for you. Um, you can also create and edit spoken audio recordings from scratch and save them in Google Drive. How to do that, I um, put here. This is a, um, a wonderful way, again, of um, using spoken English. So you can um, work with native speakers or have your students record something for one another and exchange this on the cloud in Google Classroom. Um, Text uh, speech to text tool, like I said before, you know, um, is really an eye opener, and um, you can use it to do your own dictations for students um, for home or in class. And you can also have students dictate stuff for one another and see how well their pronunciation works or doesn't work. And then they need to go to Dr. Mary for pronunciation training. Um, if people do not have a Google account, um, they can still um, work with Google and i show you a way to do that. Um, you know, here's an extension that they can use to avoid having to sign up for Google if somebody has any reason not to do that. So with that, I'm coming to the next point of collaboration. Um, dedicate planning time to collaborate with colleagues to create authentic learning experiences that leverage technology. So use your Google Classroom to work with peers in each other's country, in your countries, to develop stuff that you can all use. Build a, a professional learning community. And um, so not everybody does to do everything, but um, share good stuff with one another um, by collaboration and meeting the ISD standard. Um, also co-learn with your students um, on the new digital resources and ask students to troubleshoot and diagnose with you. And as you all know, kids are really good with that. Um, provide real world and authentic experiences. Um, and that is so important to language students um, and collaborate with experts, teams, and students locally and globally. So we cannot overstate how important this point is. 
Cultural competency, of course, is also part of our area of teaching, and um, you can do that greatly with collaboration tools. So here's something that um, gives you a tool for collaboration um, with parents, collaborative group, group work tools, four of them. You can access them here. Um, here's another link for how to use reading um, in forums. With Google, you can also access um, dictionaries and picture dictionaries, which is really awesome for beginning readers who really need to get a little push, you know, access the picture dictionary and um, dictionary in the text while they're doing Google documents. Um, you know, um, talking dictionaries you can use. I'll give you a link for that here for especially younger learners or sometimes even older learners, adults that are a little bit insecure about um, their performance and more embarrassed. Power of pictures is always something that you can insert in your teaching. Here's the link how to do that. And that's come to the point of culture. So create experiences for learners to make positive, socially responsible contributions and exhibit empathetic behavior to build relationships and communities. And coming from America and seeing what's going on here, we can never overstate the importance of empathetic behavior, building relationships and communities and not tearing them down. And so what tools can you use to do that? Um, make real L1 contacts. Here's a way of doing that. Um, authentic uh, communication with Google email, with Gmail. Um, and I have this picture here. Um, if you talk with native speakers, everybody um, in different countries looks at, <laughs> looks at things in different ways, you know. And so it's important to learn that from real native speakers, how somebody views a certain issue. For instance, um, in America, we say the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning at schools. And for Germans, that's a very fascist thing to do. And they're, they're almost shocked and revolting revolted when they see this. So um, it's good to talk with real native speakers and exchange information to find out how others see the reality. Meeting native speakers is always a good thing. Here's a, a new classroom tool for that. And I'm coming to assessment now. Provide alternative ways for students to demonstrate competency. So if you can provide them three or four different ways of showing evidence of meeting a standard like by writing a story, by um, creating a game, by creating some a picture, you know, um, but in their own way of learning, they should be allowed to show competency. Um, and um, also use assessment data to guide the process, not to punish them afterwards when they haven't gotten something, but in the process of learning by formative assessment, use that data to guide your own teaching and to say, well, I need to reteach something because they didn't get that, okay? So assessment, using it throughout in formative ways so um, it doesn't turn to be a um, put down after the fact, but it's informing your learning. So um, here are some uh, resources how you can use um, Google to be more effective in your own grading. And then, of course, don't forget the issue of back channeling, um, where the students can follow your instructions with a back channel um, and um, give you information on how well or not well they have understood something. And you can look into their comments and say, oh, that didn't work, and I need to reteach something. I use back channeling also at conferences a lot when I present something to see how people are following along. So exit tickets are a very common thing in the United States. You know, ask your kids for um, exit tickets when they leave the lesson so you can quickly see what they got or didn't get. I would use digital tools for, for exit tickets. There's also a little video on how to do that. Um, and anybody who is concerned about grading, so um, cut down uh, on the grading time by Google for self-graded, automated, ratings and use um, the link here to learn how to do that. Report cards, well, everybody does report cards. Google makes it super easy, you know, um, and also you can make um, um, statistical um, depictions like bar graphs and stuff of the whole class and show them how many people got it and how many didn't and kids really react well to those um, images. Pub publishing is a great tool to make students um, work for um, you know, show their progress they made, um, you know, 
shape, advance and accelerate a shared vision for empowered learning with technology by engaging with education stakeholders. You can have your students uh, post something that you can share with your community, other parents, with parents, other teachers, your schools. Also advocate for um, equitable access to educational technology, digital content and learning opportunities and model for colleagues the identification, exploration, evaluation, curation, and adoption of digital resources and tools for learning. So this is like my plea to you to engage in professional learning communities, to um, do especially these things um, so you can share with one another things that work. Also, um, Google presentations can be used to publish, like you know. Um, classroom newspapers are awesome and um, offer you a lot of opportunity to allow students to be creative and have each person have an authentic role in writing something. Um, content instruction you can do with Google. There are wonderful Google apps that you can use to teach um, math and science and English with Google. Teaching with Google Earth, my goodness, how awesome is this? You teach them about cities and places around the world. You may communicate with a real person somewhere and you can look their address up on Google Earth and what the house looks like from the street view. And it just puts so much life into your language instruction if you can do that. Um, you know, three things every student should be, be able to do um, minimally when they are in your class. Teaching English via content. Um, Google has lots and lots of resource groups um, for particular areas, whether it's science, history, music, math, art. Find your own community here as a teacher to get resources, um, um, lesson plans, and so forth. Content language math. Here's some things you can do uh, on Google. And um, then we need to talk about professional development and networking, something we do here today. Set professional learning goals to explore and apply pedagogical approaches made possible by technology. So like I said, you should not use technology to throw spaghetti against the wall, you know, and see what sticks, but see which kind of things are really helping your learners to be better and, and really raise their digital literacy level. You should also pursue professional interests by actively participating in local and global learning networks like TESOL or your countries or your regional conferences and groups like you do here today. Stay current with research that supports improved student learning outcomes like um, the um, Electronic Villages at the TESOL call has a lot of this material. Stay tuned and take participate in as many events as they offer because that's directly geared to standard 1C. Meet with other professionals online. Okay, so not everybody can go to a conference. Not everybody can go to TESOL conference specifically because it's so expensive and there are visa issues involved. But you can meet with others online and exchange your um, lesson activities. Um, Google Educator groups are great groups to um, hook up with other people and exchange your best practices. A free downloadable guide. And also, I don't want to be remiss to not mentioning um, the effect of making money with your uh, skills that you have. Uh, teaching online, you know, use Google Hangouts like I'm using now. You can actually teach people language skills and get paid for it by using um, something like PayPal. Um, share photos and videos with others and uh, do photo collages, you know, in your lessons that you do um, with your students or as an entrepreneur. Present at conferences, you know, like I'm doing now. And one of the standards addressed here is um, 2C, model for colleagues, the identification, exploration, evaluation, curation, and adaptation of new digital resources. I will say that in my blogs, they have thousands of entries. I do mostly curation of good stuff that I like because I do not see the need to reinvent the wheel and come up with a new Pin on everything with somebody else already invented something great. So I rather share it with everybody. Google Slides, you can also add your own webcam in there. You can make your slide presentation and in, um, insert like a video of yourself in it. Or you make a presentation like I did and in, embed your 
more in it. Um, create uh, resources for your colleagues. Um, there's resources for that. Um, if anybody likes to have fun in your classroom, you can have sticky notes with Google Slides that you can create and print out. Here's how to do that. Um, turn a Google spreadsheet into a set of online flashcards. How cool is this? So make flashcards for your kids for vocabulary studying or even ask the kids to make their own flashcards and um, create their own documents with that. Um, I don't want to also forget to talk about special needs. All of us have students that are um, challenged in one way or another. So not only do they have a very personal way of learning, but they also have um, learner differences and needs, sometimes based on challenges. So Google Drive and Google Tools have lots of accessibility tools that you can use to help those students. Um, so you don't need to come up with those accessibility accommodations by yourself. So in Google Chrome, there I give you your 21 Chrome extensions for special needs that you can use. And um, also here's a, a fun activity lesson sheet. Um, one activity that you can do is Google scavenger hunt. I When I started teaching, I did scavenger hunt, uh, hunt hunters, hunts in school, like in person, but today you can do them um, online. Um, for fun literacy activities are listed here. Creating more visuals for your classroom, you can do that with um, Google. Um, with Sketchnote, auto draw, you can do sketch notes, infographics, drawings, and more. If you try to get your students to do assessment, I would invite them to do infographics and you see if they can master something, if they can narrow it down to the most common essence, then they can do infographics and master the content. There are um, drawing organizers and collection here for you. And then also you can embed websites as iframes in Google Sites. So um, you can add your own content to Google Sites. Here's a way of doing that. Google Drawings, lesson ideas. So and then um, also we have real-time communicating as um, part of our teaching standards. Um, again, authentic learning experiences um, to collaborate with your colleagues, collaborate and co-learn with students. And all the ones that are already addressed, you know, I'll make sure that you make a lot of time for real-time communicating. So what tools can you use for that? Yak Yak is a new open source Google Hangout um, that's brand new and try it out sometime. Um, here are some um, Google Drive features for teachers um, of other languages. So if you need something to um, use in Spanish language to give instructions for learning English, use those uh, resources. And here's some more tips for using the Google Drive. Um, here's a new tool that's called Doctopus. You should try that sometime. Add-ons for teachers. Some of them I talked about. Um, there's like a clip art thing, for instance, that you can use speech recognition, template gallery, and more fun things with which you can spice up your lesson. Now, young kids really like new stuff. And here is, again, the um, you know QR code for your session here. And who of you knows what this um, little quote says on the upper left side? OK. And here is my contact. And with that, I'm going to open up for questions. Hi, Crystal. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for this amazing pre presentation. People are just excited because, just like me, because we didn't know there are so many things we can do with Google and all the information you gave us was just amazing. I wrote you some of the messages that are on the chat. You have them on the chat here. Uh, you're receiving love from WhatsApp, emails, and YouTube on this one. Um, there is a question. How to start? I mean, we have all of these tools, all of these things we can do but we're not uh, really into this technological aspect yet. What is the first step for us? Well, you know, like I said before, you know, um, I, I would start by looking at these ISTE teacher and student standards, right? 
And now let's look at what, what are the things that our students need to be and know in order to be employable later, right? Because some of you come from countries that are not very wealthy and you want your students to have opportunities in the future and make your countries better, right? So what, what are essential skills that every 21st century person needs to have? And if you look at those standards, that students go to the East, East Day side and not don't look only at the teacher standards, look at the student ones and say, oh, I need to prepare my students for that, but how should I start? Okay, so pick one thing out, right? Pick one thing out and start um, going into a professional community like um, like a website or a TESOL website or um, one of your group sites, right? on Facebook and say, how, how would you guys do something like this in your class? And start talking with one another and then start somewhere. Say like each week I try out one thing, right? Mm -hmm. So the main thing is not that the teacher uses the technology, but the students know how to use the technology, right? Our function is to model things to the students. So maybe it is that we need to have more training as teachers, right? And so maybe you can ask your country's organizations, you know, when you do conferences, focus very, very much on teaching technology. Like when you teach about literacy, add technology to it. When you're teaching about special uh, English for special purposes, ask the presenters to t attach technology to it, okay? So you can drive in your organizations, you can drive a lot of this by making it a requirement for presenters to put a technology level to it, right? Does that make sense? Yes, yes. They're saying that yes, it does make a lot of sense. And thank you. Um, before we continue with another question, people are asking if you could please share the QR code one more time for them to scan it. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and then while it's on the screen, I will have, I will give you another question so they can see the code while you answer. And it is, how do you make your students realize how important digital safety is? Because you know how young people nowadays sometimes don't realize it. You're just making their life public on social network. Okay. Like that. So how do you make them understand how important it is? Well, I mean, you can you can research some of the sites on Google. They talk about how um, colleges and employers pay very, very highly paid agencies to scan their applicants if they have any questionable activities out there. They actually do that in colleges, universities, and workplaces. They you you got you are being analyzed online, and you get get a ranking. Okay, so for instance, um, you know it's a really bad thing if you post a lot at night. Then people say, well, your life is really messed up. You're not sleeping at night, right? Or if you have any uh, any reference to alcohol or lots of selfies, then there's research that says you are a very um, narcissistic personality, right? Or, you know, find resources and bring them articles. Show them articles where people have killed themselves because something came out and, and everybody found out about it, right? Especially um, pictures with sexual images, right? Um, students uh, underage that are um, publishing in America, sending sexual images of themselves to others are guilty of distributing child pornography. Does that make sense? So you can go to prison and be labeled lifelong as a sex offender. You know, you never get another job. And so these, these things have real implications. Real implications. They can, can kill your whole life plan. And Thank so, you very much. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say uh, thank you for that part. And I want to highlight how important is what you said of teaching our students that the things they do in the digital world have real implications oh, on yeah. their life. Yeah. Um, we have another question, and it, it says, could you provide us with some advice on how to promote digital literacy? Um, I didn't hear the whole question. Can I provide you with what? with some advice on how to promote digital literacy. Yes, um, 
I would start students um, very, very early on um, doing searches online on Google and trying to find um, good sources for something, right? And um, even when they're beginners, you can say we're talking about shopping. So what kind of stores do you like to shop and find a store in America or in, in England that sells jeans or t-shirts or whatever they're interested in, you know, and, and start learning how to use internet searches right from the start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Crystal. And unfortunately, we have like one or two more questions, but oh, oh, I think we have time for one more. It says like, on average, how much time do you need in order to show some progress, uh, in order for your students to show some progress using these tools? I think the students are already using these tools um, in their own time, you know, but unfortunately, students don't know how to use digital literacy tools for learning. They use them for socializing and gaming. So I think they are probably ahead of the teachers in using them, but they're not using them for the purpose of learning and for academic reasons. So this is where we teachers are totally behind our students. You know, I, I'll tell you one example. Like when I was in Peru two years ago, um, I was in the mountains, in a very small mountains community, very far away from everybody. And everybody on the marketplace was doing um, um, the um, ah, what are, what are the little things called on the telephone that the Japanese little game that everybody did? Oh, you know, uh, what was the game na named? Everybody was looking for these little things around them, you know, on the marketplace. Oh, I cannot, I can't believe I forgot the name. It's a game that uh, a Japanese game that was um, then put out online, and everybody was doing it up in the mountains, you know. But the teachers and parents were all mystified. They're like, "What are they doing? Why are they doing that?" And I think we we teachers are we should be role models for our kids on how to use all the stuff, right? But if we don't even know how to use most basic things. They continue using the um, online stuff and the digital stuff only for gaming and socializing and not for learning. So we need to get on the curve and uh, at least be as good as they are, minimally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was really nice, Crystal. Um, um, we have no more questions for now, but if any of you has a question, remember Crystal shared her email address. And we will also share this presentation with you so you get to ask her any things if you want. And you can also visit her blog where she shares some really nice material, quite useful for us teachers. Um, before we leave, I would like to thank again um, the Central American and the Caribbean Basin TESOL affiliates for being here with us and being part of this initiative. Of course, again, to our presenter, Dr. Christian Brody, who is a Venticeller by heart. We hope to get to see you soon. Um, we want to invite you then to our following webinar, which is in more, like, in more or less like five to 10 minutes at 4 p.m. with Professor Mary Alegra from Venticeller. And let me tell you, this is going to be available to everyone. This uh, this, web, this session is going to be on YouTube for everyone to see and to share with your uh, colleagues and friends, and it's going to be available. So, Crystal, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah. how we get to see you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.